Hi everyone, welcome to our Lead AP O plus M uh, study session, our webinar today. Uh, my name is Charlie with GBS. I'll tell you more about my background in a minute. I'm joined by my colleague Allison. Allison, tell her hi. Hello, everybody. And you know, our goal today is since we're educators here at GBS, Green Building Education Services, we actually uh, are coming up on our 10-year anniversary. We were the first company to help people pass the lead exams. Really proud about that. Uh, we're coming up on 10 years uh, in business later this year. Um, O&M uh, is actually close to Allison and my heart. We love greening of existing buildings. So we want to help all of you on here and all of you here in this recording later go get that specialty lead credential because um, there's not many of you out there. So uh, excited for today's study session. Ask questions uh, over in the question mark box, in the chat box. Uh, we want to make sure, you know, some of you are taking the exam in the next two or three weeks, some maybe in two months. Doesn't matter. Ask questions. Well, you've got a couple of really good experts here. We've both passed the O&M exam and uh, really looking forward to a lively uh, discussion today. Yeah. Allison, you want to tell everyone a little more about yourself? Certainly. So I started out as an architect designing new buildings and then saw the urgency that there was to green up every part of the building process. And so I very happily jumped aboard the lead bandwagon and never looked back. So it was 10 years ago. And so I've taken multiple lead exams, successfully passed my O&M exam, recently passed the WELL AP exam. And I think it's just such an awesome and important initiative to get these certifications. So I'm glad to help you become an accredited professional. <clears throat> Allison, thanks. Uh, the O&M exam, uh, before we get into all the details, uh, what was the hardest part for you, do you think, when you were taking it? Probably some of the subtle differences between the credits. I was just reflecting on some of my notes. Like there's one specific credit that's called, you know, commissioning analysis and a very similar one called commissioning implementation. And so if you just glance them quickly, they look like the same thing but you got to understand the subtle differences of how to eat, earn each one independently. Mm, that's a good tip. Um, yeah, and Allison, everyone, uh, produces our awesome education, courses, webinars. We've got some pretty exciting case studies coming up, so be on the lookout, and uh, you'll be seeing more of Allison here on the GBS team. Uh, some of you have been on a few of our webinars before. You probably are used to my voice. I'm Charlie Cicchetti, like spaghetti, and I'm the CEO here at GBS. Uh, and I'm also involved uh, with another firm that does a lot of lead for existing building consulting and engineering. So a lot of good experience here today. I have taken and passed all the lead exams and uh, also well AP, well faculty. So uh, we're going to look through some notes from when we took the exam. Yes, all of you are going to be tested on lead version four. And so that's probably one of my tips is, hey, you're going to be taking the latest and greatest version of the O plus M exam lead version four. However, some of your buildings you're probably working on right now are still under lead version three or lead 2009. So just you've got to accept that um, you're learning the latest, but you might still be working for a little bit longer on the previous version of lead. So that can be a little tricky. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, our outline today is interactive. We want you to ask questions. If you've called in over the phone or you have a microphone, we could unmute you. We can have a dialogue. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and put those in the question mark box, and we're going to try our best to get to those. But really, we want to look at the LEED EB scorecard or checklist together. We want to look at the candidate handbook, point out some of the questions they're going to be asking. How do you deal with test day, some test taking tips, some study tips. And we want to do practice questions together because, yes, it's tricky. All of you hopefully have already passed the LEED Green Associate exam. So you've got a feel for that 100 question closed book exam at your local ProMetric testing center. Well, now you've chosen to put yourself through some more study to get this O plus M credential. It's another 100 question multiple choice exam, but now it's more detailed. I'd actually argue um, the Green Associate can be a little trickier because they can pull questions from anywhere across the green building spectrum. A lot of vocabulary, a lot of where does this fit in. The O plus M exam, though, it's we're greening of existing buildings, very st straightforward, this one program, this one rating system. How do we earn that credit 
or low mercury lighting? What number do we need to hit? So I think it's more straightforward, but it's a little more detailed. There could be some percentages, some calculations on the test. Yeah, you're definitely going to see some numbers and some thresholds, and so you need to get pretty fine-tuned into your studying. So let's show you one exciting statistic here. <clears throat> some of you have seen this before, but just Google lead professionals at a glance April. It'll pull up this past April, and it shows you that, you know what, there's 202,000 lead professionals in the world. Now keep in mind, LEED's been around for 17 years now. The first LEED project came out in the year 2000. Those were LEED for new construction. But if we scroll all the way down, we can see how many LEED grant associates there are. But how about this light blue? There are only 2,933 LEED AP O plus M professionals in the world. All of you are going to add to that number. And this is definitely a differentiator. What we do here at GBES is we help people advance their careers, and we want all of you to get this credential, be one of a small group, and, uh, and this really help you on not just your lead projects, but uh, as you go throughout your career within your company or whatever your next step is. So I think this is really exciting. This is one of the rarer of the lead credentials. Definitely. You're going to be in a very selective pool of professionals and really have the, the most amount of facts and figures to make that measurable change in your day-to-day -day life. All right, so remember, put those questions over in the question box and, uh, or the chat box. We're going to get to those, but we're really just going to go through. We've got about 45 minutes uh, together here. Um, some notes that we think you need to focus on so you know level of detail with your studies. Remember, the Lead Green Associate exam is a great credential. It's a tier one. Some people take it, stop there. You need 15 hours of continuing education every two years, okay? Others, like you, are gonna move on and take the O plus M. Then you need 30 hours of continuing it every two years, but it's a more advanced credential. You've gotta get a little more detailed. We're gonna try to show you about how detailed to get. Do you need to read the entire book 10 times? No, but there's some credits that you gotta go a little more detailed and see how do I earn that credit? So with that being said, we're just going to kind of give a few highlights in each of the categories here. This is a lead checklist, a lead scorecard. Remember, you can download those from our website, <coughs> gbs.com slash FAQ, and then you can click on lead AP O plus M resources, and this is just a nice shortcut for like our checklist right here on the right side, okay? So let's give a few tips. Um, location and transportation. 15 points. I don't know, what do we, what do we think the, the audience needs to know about transportation? I think one of the big takeaways here is that there are actually three paths to earn points here. And you're going to see that on a lot of these credits is there's not just one way to get points. So for this one, I would make sure I understand that first there are three paths and then what they are, right? So the easiest path is to just hand out a survey. You get one point for creating and distributing the survey. And let's say you didn't get a good feedback response on it. That's okay. You still get a point for going through that exercise, building the awareness. Now to get the whole 15 points, you need to actually get people to complete the survey and demonstrate that you have at least 10% of your building occupants using alternative transportation in their regular weekly commute. Now a nice kind of compromise between those, the third option is called a comprehensive program. And so this is where you're promoting that awareness through education, support like carpooling or ride matching services, and even direct strategies like offering telecommuting can help earn you those points. And so that might be see something you see in a multiple choice option, like which of these employer strategies can help you earn points in the location section. Even offering your employees telecommuting can help you earn points for alternative transportation. <clears throat> yeah, great tips there. And you know, real world, what we do as uh, consultants is you're gonna do surveys, right? You're gonna get out and make sure you get a certain percentage that respond and then we can extrapolate. But you can see here's how you get up to 15 points here 
from making sure are we getting cars off the road. Some of you saw me pull this up. You go to usgbc.org forward slash credits. And this is a really nice free online virtual um, a version of the reference guide. So you can go to existing buildings, version four, because that's what you're going to be tested on, and we can actually break down each of the credits. Remember, for your Elite AP O plus M, you've got to know how do I meet each and every one of the credits and the prerequisites. Good. All right, uh, again, shoot the questions over as we're going. Sustainable sites uh, would be next. <clears throat> um, some of you I've probably already noticed though with LEED version 4 we have a location category and a sites category. In earlier versions of LEED we only had a sites category. So they have split out the location transportation from sustainable sites. Now we're really focused on rainwater or vegetation, maybe even light pollution. Don't forget light pollution fits into this category. So uh, a few tips here for sustainable sites. Sure thing. So the first big takeaway is that there's one prerequisite. Always spend some time on the prerequisites, and that's a policy. We're going to see that most of the policies are required for every project, and they might ask you something like, which um, scope areas are required in the site policy. That's going to be things like maintenance equipment. We actually want to track if we're using low emission equipment, uh, what type of snow removal we're using, fertilizer usage. That's that's a big one. Yeah, I mean that one's pretty straightforward. Is it's a prerequisite. You have to do it. Remember on lead exams when you see have to or must, we're talking about a prerequisite. And here you can see all of the items that need to be addressed in that policy. How are we going to maintain our site a little more eco-friendly? Later, when we act on that policy, we get some extra points. But we've got to at least have a site management policy. So then, for example, like protecting and restoring habitat, there's actually two numbers we need to know here. First, we need to know that we want to um, have adaptive vegetation on 20% of the total site area, but that's at a minimum of 5,000 square feet. So they could test you on either one of those numbers. And so, again, you know, get pretty fine-tuned into the details in your studying. And so out of 100 questions, you might get up to 8 or 10 calculations, quote calculations. Now you're going to need to know some of these percentages and thresholds to hit. That's throughout the exam, but you might be asked to, hey, this much of the site is this, this much is that, and you do a very simple calculation. So be prepared. You've got to put in a little more study time here and practice a few of these numbers and these calculations. How about just a couple more tips and sites? We'll move on as we're going to do some practice questions together too. I'd say with light pollution reduction, one thing that stands out to me is uh, you might see something called the, the bug rating. Um, we can see that, but there's really two options here. We really want to make sure, are we not bleeding light out of the building at night after 11 p.m., up to the night sky, or onto a neighbor's property? What else could this affect? Well, we're going to save energy and get a better energy star score if we're just getting rid of or dimming or turning off some of our lights. Definitely. Um, also thinking about, you know, the distances when measuring those light levels. Uh, the maximum distance between your measurement points is 100 feet. So that's kind of one of those application pieces, you know, how do we actually measure this? How do we prepare for this? There's also just some um, industry terms like low impact development. Where are we going to find that? That's going to be in managing our rainwater and our stormwater. We want to encourage low impact development strategies. They can be structural, like, you know, building detention vaults. That would be a little more intensive than low intensity. Um, a more natural method, you know, would be like the, the swale, a rain garden. That would be low impact because we're not doing kind of these like major intensive construction projects. So remember, we're building on your lead green associate studies, maybe some lead experience you already have, but now we're going a little more detailed. How do I earn each, each one of these? What's the key new term that stands out or the standard or the code or, 
uh, the percentage. And so that's where we're going as we're studying for the O plus M exam. How about water efficiency? There's a couple prerequisites there. We have some questions we know show up on the exam. Here's a few tips for water efficiency. Water efficiency. So they might ask you, you know, where's an opportunity for exemplary performance there? And that's really coming from your indoor water use. We're not going to see exemplary performance for our outdoor water use although we are required to reduce it in both locations. So this was kind of one of those major things that uh, got updated in version 4, is you're now required to look at your outdoor water use. Um, I might be going a little more into the new construction area there, but um, exemplary performance is available for that indoor water use. So notice how on the scorecards it's both a prerequisite and a credit and exemplary performance. Yeah, and so they moved some points around here in this category. If you worked on an earlier version of LEED compared to this one, we used to be able to get a lot more points for their outdoor water use reduction. But just become familiar with the two prerequisites and what numbers, what percentages do we have to hit. And I know for a fact this new uh, expanded cooling tower credit definitely has a few questions on the exam. So maybe we can look at that one together. Certainly. So cooling towers, one of the big buzzwords you need to know about cooling towers is blowdown. So blowdown is when we actually eliminate water from that closed loop system. And it's to remove the contaminants, right? We need to know kind of what process it's related to and what it is doing. So the water that we remove from our system typically has increased salinity or alkalinity levels, which cause scaling inside of your system. Um, altogether, that's also kind of known as conductivity. So when you see blowdown, conductivity, I want you to think cooling tower, and just know that that's part of the process of reducing the concentration of contaminants. And you might get a question on your exam you know, how many cycles are we working towards? Ten cycles would be the optimum. Let's let that water go through our building up to ten times and then be blood off. Uh, that's our ultimate goal here. That's how we can get more of the lead points. <clears throat> so we're just throwing some tips out here we think you need to know. All right, how about the energy category? We're just giving a few hints in each, and then we're going to actually go through the handbook and remind you on the different style of questions, and then we'll do practice questions together. But how about a few tips for energy? Big category. Yeah, um, one of the exciting things here is demand response. It's also one of those multi-part uh, credits. There's different ways to earn those points. So I would look at that one just because you're probably not going to be familiar with it from your green associate studying. And it's something really cool that you might be able to get involved in in your professional life. So demand response, we want to know that there are ways to, you know, just kind of get involved on in that basic awareness <coughs> level, like getting your building ready for it, that'd be one point, um, actually installing the automated controls to respond to a demand request will get you the maximum number of points. And that's something that is really showing up on the exam and knowing the differences on how to earn those points is going to be important. <clears throat> Sorry, jumping around here. Uh, and then you mentioned, um, well, let's talk a little bit about Energy Star. Let's talk about energy audits. Let's talk about retro commissioning. I mean, all of it fits into here. Some of you on your buildings, you know, your chief engineers, your property managers, maybe your asset managers, maybe your vendor providing service to a building. You know, you've heard of this terminology, but let's kind of sort through it right now. Energy Star is an EPA and Department of Energy program. That's how we benchmark our buildings. <clears throat> you need to know that now you need a 75 Energy Star score to go for LEED. That's the new prerequisite level on LEED version 4. It used to be a 69. So Energy Star is how we benchmark the buildings. And the higher the Energy Star score, <clears throat> you can see here, optimize energy performance up to 20 points. You know what? The more... Uh, points we're going to get here on our LEED project. If you have a 95 Energy Star score, we're going to get all 20 energy points. So <clears throat> just remember Energy Star is what we use to benchmark an existing building. Um, energy audits. We're going to follow an ASHRAE level one, kind of a hands-off. 
let's find the no and low cost and the capital things you could still do to save energy in your building or an ASHRAE level two which is looking at trend data maybe placing some data loggers on pumps and equipment and really seeing when our lights on and off and making more detailed and more in-depth calculations on here's how we can tweak and save more energy but retro commissioning or existing building commissioning Allison mentioned we can get two four or now seven total points if we have a full round of retro commissioning and we commit to the ongoing commissioning so a lot of points available if we go back and tune up a building hey here's the systems we have that use energy are they running at the right settings for today's use <clears throat> so just understand an energy audit a level one is a prerequisite that shows up up here energy efficiency best management practices you have to have um, an ASHRAE level one energy audit performed. You have to have an energy star score of a 75 or higher. No CFC refrigerant or we're phasing out that R11. We have to have an energy meter for the entire building and then we meet all the prerequisites. How do we get more points? A round of retro and then ongoing commissioning and that can get up to seven more points there. Right and so <clears throat> We know that the ASHRAE Level 1 audit is a prerequisite. There's also an ASHRAE Level 2 audit, and that comes in in that existing building commissioning <coughs> analysis. So it's interesting that they split it up. You can A, just do the audit, but then if you actually implement the low and no cost uh, recommendations and improvements, that's where you get the point. So understanding, you know, what do I actually have to do versus, you know, just kind of creating a plan, setting up the, the processes. And LEAD wants to reward both, so I like that they separate them, but it's just you got to, you know, separate them in your mind, too, and understand how to comply with those credit requirements. Any questions so far? We're just giving a few tips per category so you know the level of detail for your studies. Uh, let's take a look at uh, renewable energy. <clears throat> this is now worth up to five points. We want to buy those green power offsets, or now we can actually look into carbon offsets, but we have to have a five-year commitment now, and it has to be from a green E uh, reputable source for that, say, wind farm out west that we're investing in. So just know a little more detail on each one of these lead credits. As Allison mentioned, which ones have exemplary performance which ones can we really max out and get extra points for and of course where do they fit in to lead for existing buildings okay so let's take a look at the next one <clears throat> um, materials and resources we've got two prerequisites uh, we have to have an ongoing purchasing and waste policy that's think of all the waste coming out of the building on a regular basis are we recycling even what do we do with lamps and batteries let's at least address that in a policy and then any tenant improvement, we have to have a policy. Here's how we would handle it. Here's how we would try to keep that construction debris out of the landfill. Remember with existing buildings, what goes into a policy? And then when we act on the policies and we can record those metrics, we get extra points. All right, let's go over to look at one of those policies. Because in a policy, um, Allison, help me out, we need to know who's the responsible party. When does it take effect? How are we going to measure it? There are some requirements when it gets into our policies. Which credits um, are we laying out? Here's how this site can handle all of that uh, recycling. That's right. We need to look at the scope of the people involved, the scope of the building. You know, are we talking about just things that <clears throat> the building manager purchases, or are we looking at everything that every tenant? purchases and that's really the goal here is we want to include every single occupant that's in this building to get them on board with participating in you know not only recycling but looking at purchasing those things that have sustainable labels on them um, you know another part of the scope here is it even includes a little bit of hazardous waste. So hazardous waste, remember, it's common things like batteries and mercury containing lamps. So those need to be mentioned in the policy. But this is just kind of for that awareness, right? When we actually calculate how much of that 
for purchasing or recycling, that's where you earn the points. So one question I know you're probably going to see on your exam, and remember, when each of you sit down at the local testing center, you're going to get 100 questions from a larger pool. So you might get this question, you might not, but I, I think you will. You need to now have lead version 4, 70 picograms or less. What that means is let's have long life, low mercury lamps in our building. If they have, if they're fluorescent lamps, we're going to have mercury, so we want to have a lower the number, the better. What's the number to hit on lead version 4? 70 or less. You need to know that for your exam. Just an example of some numbers you do need to memorize for this test. That's a good point. Um, another number that's related to materials is when we source those purchases, local materials are only from a 100 mile radius. All right, let's go up to the IEQ section. Uh, there's three prerequisites here. Of course, we have to bring in enough fresh air to our building when it's occupied. ASHRAE 90, I'm sorry, ASHRAE 62.1. Uh, we have to make sure we're following the lead version four has updated us to the 2010 version of that ventilation standard. ASHRAE 62.1, we have to meet that. Or if it's an existing building, and some of you are like, oh, I don't bring in that much air, they have a 10 CFM per person. Um, option D. No smoking in the building and of course green cleaning. We've got to have a policy later with green cleaning we can max out and get more points. But let's take a look at IEQ. Allison, what stands out to you? So the things that are a little tricky is like what if it's a residential building? Um, you can't necessarily prohibit people from smoking in their residence and so there are certain things we need to do to make sure that there's less smoke transmission. So being aware of, you know, sealing the penetrations in the walls and having, you know, self-closing doors, sweeps and gaskets on the doors, those kind of things help ensure less smoke transmission in a residential project. Um, another thing is about, you know, the air intake. We need to understand about how we, when we bring the outdoor air in, and make sure that we're not locating our outdoor smoking areas within, you know, 25 feet of those spaces. So they could ask you about that. Another kind of industry term that comes up in this section is the I-beam. And this is really a measure of cleanliness. And so we need to be able to connect the I-beam to our um, <clears throat> IEQ management. Yeah, and our preventive maintenance or IEQ management. So I-beam you might need to know for the exam. Who's behind that? That's an EPA protocol. So uh, that might be a question you get on your exam. But if we uh, do that I-beam audit at least once every five years, then you can earn these additional points here for that more enhanced program. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, just a few more tips in this category. Uh, we've lost a few green cleaning points. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do green cleaning, but from lead version 3 to lead version 4, uh, now we have just a few points here. They have moved pest control to two points, but within the IEQ. It used to be one point under sites, one point under IEQ. Now it's two points here. Integrated pest management, IPM. Remember, we're focused on the San Francisco Tier 3, those least toxic pesticides. And if you have to have a spraying, you know, harmful pesticide, you have to give notice, and that's called universal notification. And you're definitely going to get some questions around that. How much notice do you give? What is that called? You've got to go with your studies if you want to pass the O&M exam, just credit by credit. So if we go to the pest control, and what pops off the page? What numbers? What standard? How do we earn those two points on our project? It's going to pull up here in a second. And one of those things is these consumer labels, right? They want to make it user-friendly for you, so they're adopting these consumer labels that are already out there. And specifically for IPM, there's a Green Pro and an EcoWise that basically the pest control company can get certified as that, and then you know that we can hire them and they're going to be able to help us meet the lead requirements. Similarly, on green cleaning, those consumer labels that you need to know are green seal, environmental choice, 
in the EPA's design for environment. And there's many different labels because we know there's many different types of products, right? One of them is just looking at, you know, recycled content in paper. Another one's looking at volatile chemicals in your liquids. And so we need to know kind of that whole spectrum, green seal, environmental choice, and design for environment. That's a great point. So that adds up to 100 points. Remember, there's 100 base points in lead for existing buildings. And then there's up to 10 bonus points. So we have 110 possible points. You see that down here at the bottom right. We still need 40 points for certified, 50 for silver, 60 for gold, or a big jump, 80 or more for platinum. You, in order to earn this one point for LEED accredited professional, you have to now be a LEED AP O plus M, which all of you are about to be, to get that project that one extra point. Previous versions of LEED, you could be any LEED professional, uh, LEED AP, excuse me, um, but to earn the point going forward, you have to have a specialty LEED credential for that type of rating system, that type of building. The innovation points, remember, you can get exemplary performance. You can do something innovative outside the box. But we can get six innovation points, regional priority. You now look up this information by GIS, by location. So we'll type in Atlanta, Georgia, where Alice and I are based. And we'll look at the regional priorities here in Atlanta for existing buildings. They're going to give us six options. We can get up to four of those six points because we went after the points that are most important here maybe a high energy star score, 75 or higher, maybe we get an extra regional point there. So we'll get the points under energy, we'll also get them here under regional priority. There's, Go ahead. There's one other type of credit, a pilot credit, and they might ask you, you know, how do you pursue a pilot credit? So that would come up in the innovation section, and you actually <clears throat> register those online because they want to track who's attempting these pilot credits, and they get feedback to determine whether they add them into the rating system in the future or not. Good. Any questions? Put your questions over in the chat box. We're going to go to the candidate handbook next, and we're going to tell you a little more about the exam. Okay, here's some questions coming in. Let's see. Uh, yeah, waste question, uh, Jerry, just a second, one second. Uh, Jerry, I, I can't see how I can unmute you, so if you don't mind, type the question and we'll definitely try to uh, try to get to it, okay? Uh, the LEAD AP O plus M exam, 100 questions, multiple choice. They have updated this handbook as of July. Um, don't worry, the exam's not been overhauled or changed a lot. No, it's just um, the, at least once a year they'll update uh, some of the where are we pulling questions from uh, information. Remember to register for the exam like you did for your LEAD Green Associate. You'll go to usgbc.org. Log in, say I'm going for the O plus M, get that special code, go to prometric.com slash GBCI, and that's where you pick the day and time you want to take the exam. Let's talk a little bit about, um, and if you're a veteran, they still are reimbursing uh, fees, so thank you for your service, and you can get some of that reimbursed. Um, the last thing I was going to say here is, uh, you don't have to have worked on a lead project anymore. They pulled that requirement a couple of years ago. You just, in this case, have to have passed the lead green associate first. Um, okay. Sorry, guys. Uh, if you have any questions there, we'll try to we'll try to uh, get to those in just a little bit. Uh, so there's three types of questions on a lead exam like this. We have a recall. Those are super quick. Do we know the number? Do we know the percentage? It's just a fact. Hopefully, we can remember it. Answer, move on, keep a good pace. This exam might take you a little more time than the green associate. Uh, application versus analysis. So application is more of like a problem solving, but analysis, um, you know, the best way to describe analysis, I think, is they're going to give you even more information. So you've got to seek what is relevant and then maybe uh, see how, uh, the, you know, you come up with a better solution there. Is there a in this kind of situation, what would we do? So there's three types of questions. You want to just keep a good pace as you're going through your exam. It is kind of frustrating, but they are going to throw out 15 questions. Those are called beta questions. You're not going to be able to figure out which ones are beta questions or not. So you're going to sit down. You're going to have two hours to take a 100-question exam, and they're going to throw out some questions at the end of the test. You no longer get your score right at the end. That's a recent change. Um, they'll email you and uh, have a link to say, see your report card. Did you pass or not? Uh, 
Allison, we've seen it in minutes to up to 48 hours. So it's a little frustrating. Take the exam, take your time, answer every question all the way through. If you're not sure of one, guess at it, mark it, and come back to it later. Only change your answer if you have a good reason to do so. Remember, some will be thrown out. Uh, any other just test taking tips at the uh, Prometric Testing Center? Just a reminder that they're going to have a tutorial at the beginning and then a survey at the end. So they tack on, you know, a few extra questions for you. But, you know, just don't let that confuse you or stress you out. Just kind of go with the flow. Like Charlie said, keep a good pace. And I always use the scrap paper or a, a whiteboard that they give you sometimes, dry erase to take notes and I find that that kind of helps me recall things, it helps me with other questions. You know, you might see them give a little too much information in one area, jot it down, reuse it and be sure to mark those questions and review them with your spare time. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, someone that commented that does think that they don't get your score right, right at the end, but you can get it probably right away. You'll get it quickly. Study and pass and uh, you know we're here to help along the way. Let's just give you a few more tips and then I want to do some practice questions on our system together. Uh, a few things that make lead for existing buildings unique are the fact that we have what's called a performance period and it gets a little tricky on this test. Uh, remember lead for new construction we're designing and building green. We're going to submit all that documentation and we get credit for designing and building setting up the building to be a green building but lead for existing buildings O plus M we're operating green. We've got to prove with a quote highlight reel, also known as a performance period. See, we're operating green day to day. So your performance period for your initial certification is three to 24 months. And all of the performance periods for your lead credits have to finish within 30 days of each other. Those are a few things you need to know for your test. A couple of things they're showing us here in the handbook, lead interpretation. There's lots of lead projects that have happened. <clears throat> Maybe there's a certain question that was asked and the lead said, you know what? Okay, we interpret that a little differently. A lead interpretation you can find online. Maybe there's a question about bike racks for this type of building in this region. Maybe there's an interpretation there. So just know that that's an online resource you'd want to see has lead slightly modified the approach for a certain type of question. Um, but any, any other questions with like performance period, or the lead credits. Uh, remember, anything that happened within three to 24 months, and this is what we talked to with some of our clients, um, you know, with some of our clients, uh, did you do an energy audit last year and we're submitting for lead now? That does count. It's within the 24 month. You can go back in time and pick up on that. A couple of questions coming in about uh, new questions compared to old questions. Um, so lead version four, <coughs> has been out for the last over two years, actually coming up on three years. It's, I know it's a little frustrating that you've been tested lately on the latest version of LEED, but we've been working on maybe the, the older version. So to answer one of the questions coming out from the audience, um, here at GBS we regularly update our questions when we get feedback from customers. Maybe someone goes and passes the test and they're like, hey, I suggest you kind of tweak this, tweak that. And so uh, we continually update our questions. Um, but one of the biggest um, changes from V3 to V4 was, of course, they added the location category, much more performance-based, more prerequisites, and some of the percentages, the numbers to hit did change. So yes, everything at GBES is updated to lead O plus M version 4, and, uh, and you're good to go there. <clears throat> Any other questions coming in? One of the other things we're noticing on the exams is they're not asking for as many, you know, pick two or pick threes. That really uh, confused a lot of people up to the difficulty level. And so we're noticing that they are getting a little more straightforward. So that's good news for you as a test taker. And the candidate handbook I'm showing you on the screen, it tells you how many questions you're going to get from location five. Site, nine, water, 13. Doesn't mean you don't study location. No, you still need those five. But use this as a checklist. I know a little bit about access. I know a little bit about heat island. I know, okay, what threshold to hit for this. And so make sure you've gone through and you feel pretty comfortable with each one of these 
items. So with that being said, let's do some practice questions together. I've loaded up a uh, set of questions. Remember here at gbes.com, a lot of you are customers. Thank you very much for your business. We want to help you pass any of these lead and well exams. For O plus M, we give you 400 different questions. You can take these as many times as you want. Test A, 100 questions. It is weighted just like we just showed you. Five questions from location, 13 from water. So we've weighted them just like the real exam you're going to get into. So let's take test A. <clears throat> Maybe I'm just getting into my studies. I don't want to see my score along the way. But I do like this option. After every incorrect answer, tell me right then why I missed it. Let's start a test. Remember, some of these are more difficult than others, and uh, it can get a little tricky here. Of course, it just logged me out. Sorry about that. <laughs> Another study tool as you're taking these practice exams and it's, you know, explaining the question you got incorrect, I recommend to write that down. That's the feedback I hear from a lot of people who pass these exams is that things really commit to memory when they write down the things that were tricky for them. So take that time. Use the practice test time as study time as well to make your own notes and review your notes. So let's do a few practice questions together. And there's some uh, in the group that have maybe taken this exam before. They have some feedback. Uh, here's, here's just a question. A school project has mixed mode ventilation. Remember, we have natural ventilation, which means we can open the window. We have mechanical uh, ventilation, which means we can't open the window. And we have, you know, most up and down the east coast and in the south where it's hot and humid. We're, we're not going to have natural ventilation. But mixed mode means we actually have a little of both. During the performance period, what does the project need to do for that IEQ prerequisite, minimum IAQ? And so air filters, oh, that shows up somewhere within LEED. Measure the out there airflow, implement as defined in ASHRAE 62.1-2010, alarm if the rates increase, decrease. And so what happens is read all the answers, <clears throat> and then you're going to want to be able to come in, use process of elimination on the real exam. You can now right-click to strike through an answer you don't think it is, um, and, and that's a nice feature. But really, what are we focused on for the prerequisite? We've got to meet that ASHRAE standard first, right? First and foremost, we've got to meet ASHRAE 62.1, 2010. So that's where I'm leaning, and uh, let's make uh, <laughs> But that was not correct, so let's take a look at it together. Uh, measure outdoor airflow to demonstrate sufficient ventilation is being supplied to the building. So uh, during the performance period, what does the project need to do for this prerequisite? Um, you know, this is, this is a good example of a tricky, tricky question. So lead for new construction, <laughs> we have to prove we've designed the building for ASHRAE 62.1. Lead for existing buildings, it is a performance-based program. And the better answer is B. And this is where there's a soft cost on your projects. You have to have someone come out and test the outside air and make sure, yes, we're bringing enough CFM to these critical zones. And so actually, uh, tricky, tricky question here, but B is the big differentiator for lead for existing buildings. We actually have to measure the outdoor airflow. Right, so this standard is referenced in the prerequisite. It's used to define what the requirements are that you need to measure, but we don't specifically want to implement that procedure. They actually want to take a measurement because it is performance-based. So when in doubt, pick the greenest answer, pick the one that's going to make lead look good. In this case, uh, shame on me, uh, performance. Performance period, okay, we've got to measure the actual air. So that's kind of funny. Let's it happens to all of us, you know. We can't, can't let it get us too down. Project team is pursuing points under water efficiency credit for indoor water use reduction, so restrooms. By calculating water use, must show which requirements have been met. And so we're doing a calculation for our toilets, our urinals, our faucets, our shower heads. Is it A, every individual fixture needs to meet the credit requirements? B, every fixture is water sense? C, 20% of the water fixtures are water sense, or D, the project fixtures in aggregate meet the requirements. And so <clears throat> water sense is an EPA program. That kind of helps here. But we have to be a certain level of water efficiency. So um, let's just pretend we picked A. 
our system would say no, it's actually D. And we want everyone to know it's a 20% water savings, you know, if your building was built, uh, you know, before 1994. So in this case, it's the project fixtures in aggregate. So you can have really good toilets and urinals, but not good shower heads and maybe still get there. So we do look at all of the fixtures. Some can pull a little more than others. You know, at, at any time, you can actually hit exit the test. Our system will actually save where you left off. And you can see here we are, August 24th already, and we can hit resume. So one of my tips is take 20 questions during a lunch break. You know, go through. You can use these on your phone. You can do them at work. Take 20 questions at a time. When you complete 100 questions, this red incomplete will change, and you can click review, and we give you a report card there. One more way to use our practice test is maybe you're getting closer to your test date. You know what? Let's take the questions just by category. Let's just do water questions in a row because I'm kind of tripping up on that section. Okay, we're going to give you 54 water questions in a row. So let's do this one together. <clears throat> All right, the water sense label. So this is that consumer label that they want you to be looking for to make purchasing easier, right? So what type of fixture is eligible? Composting toilet, tankless toilet, waterless urinal, and private lavatory faucet. So one of these things kind of jumps out at me right away that is dissimilar from the others, and that's the composting toilet. If you take a moment, think about it, what does that mean? That basically means it is waterless. So it's different from the, the waterless urinal because that is still connected to traditional plumbing systems. So it's going to have some like gray water use associated with it. But the composting toilet, I think, is the best choice here because it's not intended to be connected to your plumbing system in any way. It's basically an, an independent type of system. And it's typically not going to be something you're going to be able to buy off the shelf at Home Depot. So something with that consumer label, think I'm you know, going to order it on Amazon, what am I not going to find there? I think the best choice is A. So the <laughs> so that was tricky, and so uh, you have to be real careful. Is or is not. Um, so, for the record, it's late in the afternoon, <laughs> Eastern time here. But uh, here we are. Let's walk through this together. Um, to me, composting toilet, no. Water list, no. You have to use water to be able to be eligible for water scent. So A and C, I would throw out, and then we get to B and D, and. And I've never heard of a tankless toilet. So sometimes on the real exam and on our practice test, it's like, what, what is that? And, and, and yeah, sometimes in a commercial building where it's just piped straight in and we're not regular. Okay, no, it's D. The correct answer here, and our system says, look, here are the types of fixtures that are eligible, and here are the fixtures that are not eligible. So, oh, so I totally misread the question, and that's why I not. got it wrong. Yeah, is or is not, yeah. So at any time, you can hit exit to test. And so all of you are freaking out right now, like, gosh, if Allison <laughs> and Charlie can't get that one right, then how the heck are we? <laughs> no, these are tricky. We're kind of rushing here. Let's do one more together. Let's go out on the high note here. I think that maybe another takeaway on that, then, is keep the information fresh. You know, don't study it and then put it down and then take the exam two months later. You know, I don't want to encourage you to cram, but just a little bit every day. Keep it fresh. Keep it relevant. You know, we're here trying to help people pass multiple different exams. We're not looking at this standard every day. So I would say just focus on that one thing that you're aiming to pass and keep it in the front of your mind. So let's just do a couple more. If there's any questions, though, load them up in the question box or the chat box. Uh, a project team for a commercial building with multiple tenants is creating a facility maintenance and renovation policy, right? That's something we have to do for an existing building going for LEED version 4. At a minimum, what should they include? So this is a pick three, paint touch-ups, MEP work that does not require significant alteration, HVAC upgrades, tenant sit-outs, building improvements, replacing worn-out entryway mats. 
And so right away, we're going to take a look at do we exclude certain systems like HVAC? We're going to need to know that or not, but definitely building improvements. I think we'd want to include that, right? And so we go through and we take a look at um, what would fit into if we're going to do a facility maintenance and renovation. What is maintenance? What is renovation? A little tricky here, isn't it? So think about kind of things that would happen frequently all over the building. Um, that's what these policies really want to capture is those high frequency regular things that we just want to formalize the process of. So if something seems like the scope is too huge or too, um, you know, unique, it's going to be excluded from a prerequisite policy. And sometimes you'll find two answers and that third one is kind of tough. But let's just pick and let's see what happens. In this case, it was actually going to be more of the project. HVAC, tenant fit outs, and building improvements, that's what we need to write a policy around. Within that policy, we'll talk about paint touch-ups. We'll talk about replacing carpet. And so in this case, we wanted to go high level, C, D, and E. <clears throat> what strategies can be used to assist a building owner with multiple tenants uh, in reaching that 60% of purchases? We want to buy uh, for all those more ongoing consumables, how do we get to 60% compliance here? And um, we go through, do we focus on low cost, non-compliant? Focus on low volume, non-compliant? Select products that meet more than one size sustainability criteria? That one sounded pretty good. That does sound good. Track data at the end of the reporting period to reduce documentation time. Swap non-compliant with comparably priced products. So this one's a pick two. And, you know, again, we got one answer right away. The good news for all of you on the new exam, they're really doing more pick one, A, B, C, or D. Um, so we want to focus on the low-cost non-compliant, maybe swap those out, or are we already saying we're going to swap these out here? And so in this case, we got it right. Woohoo! All right, any questions coming in um, from uh, anyone that's been studying, anyone that has the test coming up? If you have not registered for your exam, register, because that's going to force you to study. This is a really important credential to earn. Hopefully some of you are already working on lead projects. Actually, we want to kind of survey those that have joined us today. So I'm going to throw out just a couple quick polls as we have some closing remarks or any questions that are coming in. And so let's just ask, um, you know, have you or are you working on a lead project? Yes or maybe not yet. So let's throw that out. <clears throat> Again, any questions, put them over in the chat box. And, uh, and we'll give you a few more tips. Um, to study for this exam, what's really, really important, in my opinion, is to schedule that test date far enough out and get your resources together. Do I want an in-depth course or do I want to just take lots and lots and lots of practice tests because they're tricky? Mm -hmm. Do I want to read the entire study guide, reference guide? you got to know how do you learn best, right? Everyone's a little different. Some like to read to learn. Some like to just take notes. Some like a full comprehensive course. Others, I'm just going to take every single practice test that GBS has, and hey, maybe that's a good option. If you do that, my only caution is if there's a certain category you're not doing great in, then if you would, please <clears throat> go back and read up on the category you're not doing so hot in, say water efficiency. If I'm not scoring high there, I've got to go learn more about water efficiency. So there's a poll there. I don't know if everybody sees that. If you just want to real quick, yes or not, not yet. Have you worked on a lead project? Um, what other tips, Allison, do we have to pass the O plus M exam? So we know that energy and water metering is required, but they might even ask you, you know, at what frequency should you be reading these meters? We want to make sure that we're getting readings at least monthly and then put them into annual summaries because then we want to share that data with the USGBC. That is part of the prerequisite is that you agree to share your data with the USGBC. Great. Yeah, and we've got some in the group that looks like 67% are on a lead project and uh, we've even got a new building coming out of the ground in DC. That's pretty exciting. Um, so go ahead and put in this poll. When do you think you'll take the test? We know life is busy, work is busy. We've got some pretty 
stellar study tools here we want to make sure you have access to. Um, but we, Alice and I are passionate about O&M and we want to make ourselves available. We're going to give you our email. We want you to have access to us. We want you to pass this test. <clears throat> so one more poll, if you would throw up, when do you think you'll take the test? Next week, in the next couple months, more than two months out, or you're just learning. If you don't mind, fill out that poll and we'll, uh, we'll be wrapping up here. Okay, uh, so let's just uh, go back to the slides just for a second. Remember, um, <clears throat> we've got a lot of great tools here at gbes.com. We've got the webinars that we're providing to you. We've even got some recorded courses. We've got flashcards, study sheets, practice tests. But no matter what, make sure you take lots and lots of practice tests. And so you can get those on gbes.com. Um, we've got a few more webinars coming up. We appreciate your support. We're going to have an open study hall in a few weeks. Lead well, doesn't matter which exam. We're going to have some experts uh, around table. Just ask any and all questions. And then look, in this group, you definitely want to join. You've probably heard a lot about ARC and LEAD Performance Path, formerly known as LEAD Dynamic Plaque. We're going to have a really cool webinar September 21st, all about LEAD Performance Path and uh, another way to get your existing buildings maybe recertified down the road. And then uh, end of September, we're going to really be talking energy efficiency. We've got some uh, deeper dive there, more of an advanced course going. So actually, yep. that's all fitting for all of you that joined us today or are watching this recording. Uh, to get to those webinars, you can go to gbes.com forward slash live hyphen webinars, and we'll get all those up. So any closing remarks, Allison, O plus M exam? I'd say just keep it fresh, you know. Commit it to memory by putting that pencil to the paper, read your notes, and you're going to do great as long as you're just having a consistent study practice. Yeah, and, and you know, we were joking around the practice task, just uh, put in the time. If you're going to study over the next two or three months, just uh, break it down. You know what? This week I'm going to learn about water efficiency. I'm going to take water efficiency questions until I'm competent there. Next week I'm going to do energy. Spread out your studies. Uh, we're here. Here's our email addresses again, allison.laura at gbes.com, or one of my uh, good emails to catch me is charlie at gbes.com, okay? So anything else? Uh, everyone, thanks so much for being with us today. Hopefully that boosted your confidence and gave you a few insider tips. But go ahead and register for and go earn the LEAD AP O plus M exam, and then give us feedback. Uh, let us know how it went, and uh, we're definitely here here to help. So thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. Have a great weekend.